Hi, this is Frederick Valles. I'm the founder and CEO of Optimizer. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for another great educational webinar in the series that we've been doing. So today we have Lisa and Melissa. I know both of them from speaking at PubCon. So PubCon is one of the big conferences uh, for SEO, social, pay-per-click. It happens once a year in Las Vegas. That's their big event, and they also have uh, smaller regional events. So I've been fortunate to be teaching a bunch of the master's classes. So that's a full day session before the, the conference starts. And we have all these specialty tracks. So I've been teaching uh, together with Brad Geddes, the PPC track for a couple of years. Uh, Lisa and Melissa, they've been teaching more on the social media and the PR side. So um, since we know each other, I thought what uh, they could bring to us is a lot of insight from some of the things that maybe we don't work on so often. Social media, so my audience is mostly PPC. So. Uh, Lisa and Melissa, welcome today, and uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much, Frederick, for having us. We're happy to be here and happy to um, kind of share the knowledge and collaborate because you know we always go by the um, the saying that um, working in silos is kind of yesterday, and everybody working together and sharing it, whether you're on PPC or SEO or social media, you kind of have to all have to be on the same page. Yeah, I love that. And the more we know about what the other people are doing, uh, the, the more it can benefit our role. So, um, but then I'm actually curious who's on the call today. So uh, we're going to have a quick poll here. Um, the question is, what is your role? So if you work on an in-house team, an agency team, or a consultant, uh, there's no other option. Uh, but go ahead and select from those. We have uh, people vote here for a second. So um, um, Melissa, maybe why don't you start? Uh, uh, what's What's your company looking like? Or maybe we'll start with Lisa. Lisa, uh, would yeah, ask, yeah. Oh, um, sorry, my mic was muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> okay, um, I I do a variety of things. Um, I'm an advisor at PubCon. I'm an editor at Simrush for the U.S. blog. Um, I work as a consultant on the side, helping businesses with social media and content. Um, and I do training services as well. So. Nice. And Lisa. I also have an agency, the Buyer Group, and I specialize in a blend of social media, public relations, and search marketing. I come from a traditional public relations background and um, was an early adapter of SEO into the strategy of public relations and then early adapter of social media into the strategy of public relations. So my, um, um, my angle is looking at how can we best get publicity, positive publicity, and leverage it using social and search. And I also wrote a book called Social PR Secrets, which we um, I use at a class I teach at University of Florida. So a little bit of education, a little bit of consulting, and special projects, and then the, the conferences such as PubCon. Nice. And so uh, the poll results, we had about half of the attendees are in-house, the other half are agencies, a few consultants on the call as well. Um, and the good news is it looks like the next question, do you work on social media? It's pretty much all yeses that I'm getting here. So that's excellent. I never know with my audience because uh, obviously Optimizer is much more on the AdWords and Bing ad side. Uh, but like you said, there's a lot of crossover these days, right? So people still work on social media. Um, and even I am on social media all the time. I mean, we kind of have to be these days, right? So Definitely. Um, with that, this poll was very boring, 100% yes on social <laughs> media. I'm glad we asked it anyway, just to make sure. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to the two of you. I really look forward to hearing some of the amazing, crazy stories about disasters. Uh, I think it should be very entertaining. And uh, the floor is yours. OK, great. So. We decided um, talking about hiring a social media pro is not as easy as it might have been or people might have thought, thought it was even two years ago, five years ago. It was, oh, let's hire the intern to help us with social media. And um, that can cause a lot of problems, whether it's an intern or just somebody not experienced. So Melissa and I um, have integrated this content into our master session and also in other types of um, training sessions on how important it is to hire the right person for uh, to be a social media manager or just on the front lines of social media. So this is just a little bit about both of us. We already pretty much went over it. So I'm just going to jump right into the agenda of what you can expect us to go over today. We're going to talk about the psychology and what it has to do with social media pros. 
um, <clears throat> some examples of social media disasters. And Melissa and I have tons of examples. We couldn't we couldn't really decide. Melissa's like, how are we going to fit it all into this amount of time? Because um, there's a lot of um, mishaps that happen. We're going to talk about credentials and, the, and certain courses and training. If you're hiring a social media manager or pro, what to look for, and if you're trying to be hired, what you should um, put inside your in your in your credentials, and then how to keep them happy once you hire them, and looking at different policies and procedures and what. Um, what you should think about ahead of time versus being reactive and thinking, oh no, why didn't we think of this before the situation came up and we could have given our team guidance. Melissa, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, well the disasters are kind of sprinkled throughout, so you're gonna to have to keep your eyes on the slides. <laughs> yeah, and we'll we'll tell some stories throughout throughout too and um, give you some more scenarios of what we we've seen out there. Yeah. Yeah, too much. Okay. Well, this is a, a quote that I really like. When I, I when I do consulting, people keep saying, why does it matter who we hire? You know, it's all about saving the, some money, get the cheapest person you can get to run social media. And uh, Bernstein has this great quote, just having social media skills is insufficient when you're dealing with the reputation of a company. Um, I mean, you hire the wrong person and you can destroy a company real fast. And the next slide has an example of that. There you go, IHOP. So someone thought this was really funny. It didn't go over very well with the um, female followers from IHOP. Some of the men thought it was funny. Some of the men did not. The bottom line is, is people get very offended today pretty much about everything. So you have to, before you share anything or even try to be humorous in any way, you really have to look at things from every possible perspective. How could this be offensive? Because while some might think it's funny, others won't. That works in comedy, but it doesn't work on social media. Totally, and I think one of the things that has changed over the years and really become super critical with social media is that it's not just, okay, I understand how Facebook works or I understand how Twitter works or I understand how Pinterest works. It's really knowing um, the full picture of the content and being able to kind of have the the um, foresight to what will what will happen, how will this work once it's published? Because you're under a much much brighter spotlight than you were even a year ago. Yeah. Uh, yep. All right. So how do you handle tons of personalities when you're dealing with social media? A lot of people say, you know, how do you do this? Because there is a there's a ton of you know personalities but within those personalities are people that have uh, different moods you know sometimes they have a bad day sometimes they don't you really have to hire the right people to run your social media team so what I'm going to kind of review today is looking at things from a psychological perspective that is my background is psychology um, so I'm going to kind of just break down uh, first what we look at personality wise and we're going to move into credentials so so some desired personality traits, they seem simple, genuine and caring, um, understanding, easygoing, you need someone that can communicate well and with good grammar, um, they need to work well with others within your company, if they can handle that, that's a good sign, they need to be able to adapt to any situation as quickly as possible because social media changes, um, trolls are there, to, you know, they also have to be able to control their temper. And then I have a few more on my next slide. Um, self-disciplined. You can't be on social media without being self-disciplined. Um, Hardworking. They need to be educated in your field, first of all. Let me start with that. I'm not saying you have to have a traditional education, although that is nice as well. You want to be educated on your topic and on social media. They need to be totally focused on what's best for your brand. Uh, driven to do a good job for you because sometimes when you're running social media you got to get out of your bed at 1130 and deal with the crisis. Um, an analytical thinker that can look at things from all sides and you'll be able to learn things as fast as possible and want to learn more. And let's see. The number one thing is they have to like people. When I say this to people and companies I'm training they're like what do you mean everybody likes people? 
but they not everyone does so if you actually ask in an interview you know what do you think of people in general you might be shocked at what you get they may say people are irritating they're so dumb I don't even know how to deal with them as soon as you get that you know that that person is probably not great for the job um, you have to like all personalities and let's go it's almost next. like you have to have a natural customer service personality <clears throat> in person and that would translate into social because we have a whole section on customer service now in our master's training that has to do with just naturally being customer service oriented and want to help and versus like Melissa said earlier just flying off the handle or being impulsive yeah and and it's hard people people it's hard dealing with people all day long um, so you want to be look for, looking for people that are capable of being tolerant no matter what the situation they have to be accepting of everyone for who they are do they have self-control do they have empathy um, the right temperament is critical and when and I'm gonna give you some examples of what to do in an interview with someone that will kind of give you an idea of what their tolerance level is like how they handle pressure Humor is also a really good thing. This tweet went out during the Super Bowl. Um, I recommend everyone follow this Wyoming, Minnesota Police Department because it's the funniest Twitter account. Um, but if you look at the engagement they've got, and this was at that night, if you go to this tweet now, um, it is way higher. The amount of engagement and what this police department's trying to do is to put a different spin on the view of police officers. We all know they kind of have a reputation problem right now. Um, a lot of police departments are doing this on Facebook and Twitter, just trying to give you a different perspective that they're good, kind people, and it works. Um, we looked at some personas here, didn't we? <laughs> Lisa, yeah. not to, to look at um, who you don't want to hire necessarily. Yeah, so we have um, a whole section in our master training on personas, um, developing personas for your customers. But what we're recommending is to develop personas for what would be the best persona for your social media team. So we this we just kind of put this as a joke. You know, the person that comes and they're um, applying for the position and they're like, oh, we have um, I have five thousand friends on Facebook, and that's you know that's why I'm so experienced on Facebook. So. People that are boasting about um, their own personal um, quantity of followers or connections doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the best person to handle your brand's social media. So um, another example of a persona would be maybe, you know, Debbie Downer or drama queen Kim or Keith, um, you know, looking at somebody that can those are the personas that you want to avoid and what would be the label the persona what would that social per, the, the social media manager for your brand what would they look like um, from a characteristic standpoint and what would be their best traits and really create a persona for your social media manager just like you would for your audience and you know that's that's a whole other subject that a lot of brands aren't doing um, but from a social media hiring standpoint really coming up with what would be the best char characteristic and persona for your brand Yep, definitely. And then just moving into credentials. So what should you look for when hiring a social media pro for your brand or for your agency? So there's different um, types of credentials and just the checklist would be qualifications, looking at what are their qualifications, what's their background, what exactly are they bringing to the table, what is their education, and specifically, what is their what did they specialize in, um, what was their degree in, certifications, proof of work and personality. And I'm gonna break that down. Um, Melissa's gonna give an example here. Of oh just... yeah, there, there, there's a fail for you, Frederick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that they know how to spell. Education goes into that. Um, and, and I just wanna state that if you, you always triple check your tweet. Read it back to front and uh, front to back. Look for a typo. That was uh, autocorrect here or uh, somebody actually spelled it that way? They actually spelled it that way. Because I don't think that's an autocorrect, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that word before. But we don't know. We don't know. So as far as qualifications, um, these are some of the, the main qualifications to look for. And some of these completely get missed. So you want your social media 
pros to be strong writers. You want them to have um, a creative side to them. So they need to also be, a lot of times it's a one man show or one person show for social media. So they're designing the content and they're, they're writing the content. And they need to be super passionate about your brand, product, or service. They really love it. They need to be a brand advocate, somebody that is just in love with what you do. And there's really a very short learning curve when you're hiring them. They're already very familiar with your brand um, or your industry, and they understand your competition. They have um, a personality that matches your culture and your team and your brand persona. And then super important is to have a basic understanding of SEO. So with social media, each, you know, we, Melissa and I always say this, you know, look at each, each network as its own basic search engine. So, you know, people are searching in Facebook, they're searching in LinkedIn, they're searching in Pinterest, whatever your, your channel is, your primary channel for your audience, making sure that your content, you're writing with optimization in mind and keywords in mind. And um, somebody just, you know, that doesn't have any background in SEO is really not going to have that basic SEO um, writing skill. So super important to um, have that optimization aspect. Also, um, somebody that's extremely actionable and strategic um, is in, in kind of, I'm going to say, analysis paralysis of every step they're taking. You have to move pretty fast in social media. It's almost like you're writing, you're running a daily publication that is publishing, you know, in some cases, every hour new content. So um, things can't take a long time, but you also have to get it right. Um, and then also come from a place of constant learning. So attending conferences like PubCon or attending um, the different webinars like we're putting on today, it's not get your degree, get your job, and move up and continue from job to job, social media job to job, because things change. Frederick, that's why, you know, the three of us are sitting, you know, we each year go to PubCon and pretty much are, you know, it's a constant learning in our industry, especially in search and social. Yeah, definitely. And if you even just get one good positive tip out of something, it's worth your time. So totally, totally. Looking at the education um, recommendations. So a college degree, great. Um, what should that college degree be in? What, what should you look for? Uh, journalism, public relations majors do really well in social media because they already come out, um, you know, even former journalists are excellent at social media because they're used to writing on the spot, writing on deadlines. Um, somebody coming from an uh, advertising telecom background with a degree in that is great. Psychology is awesome. Melissa is a perfect example of that because they can understand, you know, kind of the empathy and compassion part and the psychology behind writing for different audiences. Um, business marketing is also very good. And now we even have a master's of social media being offered at some um, accredited colleges and universities. I'm a little biased. I teach at University of Florida and I also graduated from there and we're one of the first to come out with the masters of social media. So you can even get a, um, a master's and, you know, looking for these types of educational credentials are super important when hiring. And then looking at certifications, so there's a variety of different um, offerings of certifications. Hootsuite offers social media marketing certification, three or four different ones. But when you see um, somebody with um, having a certification in a platform, that tells you, especially it's a platform you use. If you use Hootsuite, you want to hope that, that you're not going to have to teach somebody how to use Hootsuite that you're hiring. They already know it. Buffer off offers a seven-day crash course. Um, Bootcamp Digital offers a variety of different social media certifications. Facebook itself and Twitter, they offer free courses. Um, you know, basically everything you need to know about Facebook, everything you need to know about, about Twitter, they're a little bit slanted towards the paid side, but, um, but I mean, it, it's there for you. And, and if you're hiring somebody that's gone through this, this, you know that they've been, you know, really well schooled. Pinterest also just started offering free webinars um, on the business side. And then Udemy also offers some, some courses on social media certification. Do you guys have a favorite here in terms of maybe us on the call learning more? Because I know some of these certifications tend to be maybe a little bit heavy on the product side and not on the uh, maybe more what you respond to, how you write. So any favorites I, in those regards? I don't really look, um, I'll be honest, at a ton of certifications. But if they say to me, well, I've gone through like, you know, hours of Facebook blueprint, the fact that they even know what it is tells me that they've put some time and effort into learning. 
Um, so I'm a little different in the certification realm in that if I, I usually have lots of questions to be able to say to figure out how much they know versus, but if they come to me and say I got certified in XYZ, then I know they've really pushed themselves. So I don't, I can't, I can't say I have a preference for anything at this point. Yeah, and I think that um, they all are a little bit um, skewed towards their product. Obviously, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. Um, but if you if if, so, if somebody comes and they're applying for the position and they have this on their as a credential, it's a plus. You yeah. know, it's not something that's a must, but it's definitely give that person a plus because they they're doing what we said in the slide, you know, before that they're constantly learning and it shows that they're up to date. And like Melissa said, the fact I mean, Twitter does not go, you know huge in advertising their Twitter flight school. If somebody found the Twitter flight school, that's pretty good. And they did it. Same with Facebook. Um, it's, it, it's almost like, you know, finding a needle in the haystack to know that they even do that. And something I comment about later down when we get further into the slides is that um, all businesses should really be giving their social media team paid time to learn things like this. I mean, there needs to be a certain amount of time where you're allowing your team to grow. Um, it helps you retain employees, but it also helps your business. So, yeah, we even worked with an agency, and they specifically pay their people for passing the Google certification, the AdWords certification, uh, mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. Uh, and some of that, because then it fundamentally goes to them being able to use the tools they need for business day to day, and it's worth seven hundred and fifty bucks to have them quickly go through that and become productive employees right from the get go. Yeah, completely. That's great. And and we would all. I mean, I think it's on our, one of the slides coming up. But Google Analytics, um, even Google AdWords certification is is somewhat relevant to social media management because of what we talk. You know, just the crossover and being able to understand what the other is doing. But for the to learn the keyword research and learn um, that end of it, and and also be able to apply that to your social media content. The Google Analy Analytics is critical in you know figuring out how to measure. So these types of, you know, you don't need Google Analytics, like their whole certification might be overkill for a social media manager. They might be like, you know, kind of get lost in, in all of that because it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's not, they don't need all of that. But there's a lot of different um, training that might not be exactly social media that can be applied. Yeah, I agree. And then the proof of work. So looking for true examples when you're when you're getting applicants. So looking at okay, so show me some of the profiles, the Facebook profiles or Twitter profiles that you've personally worked on or managed, and what were examples of some of the most successful posts and messaging, and why were they successful, and what did you like about it, and what exactly did you do behind this message to help create it. Um, and then looking at maybe example reports from previous work that show here's my reporting system and here's, here is, um, you know, how we, we generated our reports and this is the system that we used and maybe they used Sprout Social or maybe they used a, a blend of Google Analytics and Facebook Insights and really, you know, getting down to, okay, you know, showing us how, if you worked for us, how would you report to us and how are you used to re giving us reports on the success of social media. And then another important aspect is, you know, actually measurable success. So yes, we have X amount of engagement and we have this many likes and we have, um, you know, this many views on Facebook Live. Well, what does that mean? Like, how does that relate? How does that really connect with the business objective of the brand that you're working on? And that right there, I would say, Melissa, is, you know, one of the biggest, okay, that person's out because they don't, they've never even done that before. They didn't have to. Well, the thing that I see that's really a huge fail is that a lot of these people are told, get shares, get shares. Their belief is, and their bosses want to see the most possible shares. But the question is, is how much does that convert? So if, if you're a business and you're putting all this money into social media and shares, there has to be a payout at the end somewhere. So if you have less shares and more conversions, that's better for the brand. You know, like unless unless your goal is just simply branding, but at some some point down the line, money has to pay for the work going into social media. So um, if they don't understand that, that's a big red flag. 
and in all the reports in social media examiner and um, simply measured you know the biggest challenge right now in social media is defining roi and measurement that's the biggest challenge that brands have um, in the latest reports so that that is the biggest challenge so if that is the biggest challenge there has to be um, everybody needs to be on the same page with okay what do we call success and how are we measuring it and your social media professionals need to also be able to understand what that means to whatever, making it relevant to whatever brand they're working on. Yeah. Um, I always like to ask for some sort of case studies when I'm screening social media applicants. So give us an example of a success story that you did for a brand, almost like, you know, companies have success stories on their website. When somebody's applying, create, you know, having them create a success story and then getting testimonials from other people that they've worked for, other brands that they've worked for, you know, this, you know, basically means the same thing as references, but, you know, taking it up a notch and saying, okay, what did this person really do for me? And, and tell us why I should hire this person. Yeah. And then, and here, here's an example for you, Frederick. This lady said she was trapped in an elevator at the airport and eight months later, Amtrak got back to her. <laughs> So there's a fail for you. <laughs> I don't think she would have lived that long. So um, the other question I always ask people is, well, what do you feel about response time? If people fail 24 hours is okay, might not work for your brand. Uh, that's something to definitely consider. And just being on the front line. So you know, how used to if somebody's going to be on the front lines? Are they? Do they have experience being on the front lines and being able to answer some of these questions um, that they might get asked? And what's the system in place? Right. And when I worked at Moz, I would, they're in Seattle. So I got, I worked from eight to 1230 on the East coast time. They weren't even awake. So you, um, you gotta have someone covering your bases, but now Twitter and Facebook have, uh, allow you to set times that you're available, which wasn't available before. And that's fantastic. Um, some tips I have about interviewing. Everyone says, check social media channels. I say, go deeper, look at their, um, tweets and replies and see how they respond and go back about a month before you're gonna hire them with a Twitter advanced search. Just kind of look and see how they talk to people when they know they're not applying for a job. In regards to Facebook, I don't just look at their initial five, 10 posts I see on their page. I look at their friends that are prevalent in their pictures and I go to their pages and I see how, how they talk on their friends' walls and not, or posts and not just on their own. Um, people are ignorant or hateful, rude or disrespectful in their social shares, odds are they're going to probably behave that way at some point on yours. And then I'll have another slide here. Um, if you wouldn't want to engage with people online based on their behavior, then you definitely don't want to hire them. The other thing I suggest doing is compare your, uh, their resume. When did they leave their last job? Did they go on social media and trash the company that they left? Um, any kind of passive aggressive behavior is something you want to look out for. Um, Lynn, we're going to move into the interview itself. So, um, one thing I look for is, and we talked about, you know, self-discipline and hard work. Um, if they looked at your website and your social accounts before the interview, that's a great sign. Uh, if they can come in and go, yeah, I reviewed this and, um, I have some ideas or I didn't like this and let's move to the next slide real quick. And um, Basically what recommendations do they have for you? What would they change? Uh, what problems do they see? To me that says this is the kind of employee that I want because um, they bothered to take the time. I didn't have to ask them or pull out a laptop and say what do you think? And then the next thing um, is did they look at your competitors? They didn't come in and say you know I reviewed your your Twitter feed versus your competitors and here's what they're doing, here's what you're not doing, that right off the bat tells me, wow, they've, they've got their stuff together and um, they're looking at things from an analytical perspective and, and I want that. I can't tell you how many times I'm working with a client, helping them screen for their social media position and we ask this question and I would say the majority have not even bothered looking at the competitors. So it's, it's almost like a you know, when you're on the hiring side, you might assume this, but it's it's a it's a very good question to ask. Yeah. 
And then the next thing, here's one for you, Frederick. Uh, this is from the U.S. State Department. Not a 10 in the U.S., the not a 10 overseas. This didn't go over very well. I like to give mock scenarios and hand them a bunch of examples like this and say, what's wrong with it? And if they can't tell me, then that, that then I know maybe we have a problem. And then our next example is also a little painful. This was on Happy Woman's Day. Beck decided that let, look like a girl, act like a lady, think like a man. That didn't go over well at all on Women's Day. I've was shown... Huh? Made, uh, at one point, I think it may have been big, but they came out with pens for ladies because ladies apparently need different types of pens than men. Yes, pink ones. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I'll be honest, I like pink pens, but I don't. I also like other pens. Um, I like pink pens. Right? I mean, can I buy one of those, please? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I have handed this to a few men who thought that they uh, wanted to be in social media, and they could not see how this would be offensive, um, and why it was offensive. So that that was a big sign. Then my next example is these really aren't bad, but what could go wrong? Um, with Ellen, this was during the Olympics, uh, and Usain Bolt was just killing it, and she thought this was funny, but it, um, social media got very upset and was implying that she was using him as a slave. So that's the what could go wrong, and with, when Carrie Fisher died, this is neat, but it looks like they're trying to sell their product, and a lot of people were upset. So while these aren't overly offensive at first view, this is where you have to be have one of those people that can look at it from all perspectives and say, okay, what could go wrong with this? Right. If somebody dies, say nothing or offer your condolences. That's pretty much uh, the two. That's it. Yeah. And saying nothing is most of the time the best route to go because nobody's really going to know if you didn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, right. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough call. And Melissa and I have been covering this um, for three years now. And it's becoming a little bit more, I would say, a gray area because a lot of brands, they, wanna, they want to get on and, um, and share their condolences. Really, when anything bad happens, whether it's the, um, you know, the Ariana Grande bombings that happened, I mean, everybody is just so, you know, it's like this is the new normal and everybody just gets so upset when these things happen. It's, it's hard to resist not just getting in there and just, you know, tweeting about it or or sharing condolences, but crazy things end up backfiring. Um, Melissa, the, the story about the hurricane that was, um, you want to share oh, that? Yeah. I don't think we have an example, but that's a good, yeah. good example. Every workshop training, I have a whole deck on like fails for the year. And uh, one of the hurricanes in Florida, everybody started going on Twitter and saying hurricane sale. Um, they were trying to sell their products and they were trying, I mean, it, it's just, it's, you don't um, take a tragedy and go, you know what, I'm going to use this for, for profit. Um, and this happens a lot. It's, now, that part of things, I think, has improved from the larger businesses. Um, but if you go into a Google image search and you look for um, social media fails when Prince died, you'll see a lot of brands that could have just said, you know, we loved Prince, our heart is with their family, whatever, but they went too far. Um, in regards to the last few pictures, discernment is critical. If they cannot look at images that you present in front of them and say this could go wrong or this could go wrong this way or this is a problem I see, they really should not be controlling content or um, imagery for your social media. Um, the ability to see what could go wrong in all situations is, is really important. So the other thing, Number one job, in my opinion, is to protect the brand. Um, every, every social media person who's dealing with the public or the community has to be focused on that. Um, whatever they are typing, you know, if it's going to hurt the brand and they can't see that, um, then they're not right for you. I think every customer you deal with, you kind of have to respond with uh, a loving attitude, you have to show as much empathy as possible. You want to help the cu customers in any way you can. Um, some quick examples of that. Um, 
when I was working at Moz, there was a guy who was just ripping us apart. <laughs> like, he was very upset, and I tried to be as nice as possible, and I talked to him offline. I got him offline, and he, he had just found out he had cancer. So clearly he was having a bad day. <laughs> so it wasn't about the brand. It's not a personal attack. Sometimes people just have a bad day. So the kinder you can be to them, the better. Um, and uh, once Moz had a DDoS attack and the whole site was down and people were like, I needed this article for a presentation and I, I was telling people, teaching them how to go into the cache on Google and find the information they needed. I mean, you just go the extra mile. You do whatever you can um, for the customer and that helps the brand. So... Speaking of going the extra mile, so once you have these social media professionals hired on your team, it's super important to give them an environment and making sure that you're mindful of keeping them happy so that you can um, keep them. And obviously, it's it's you know better to invest in keeping employees um, than having to keep rehiring. So hire Especially great employees, the good, one. the, yeah, good, the one. good ones, and then keeping them. Yeah. So um, here's some tips on, on, on doing that and creating an atmosphere within your brand or within your agency to um, making sure that, that you're making them, you're giving them a good environment to do the best, that best they can. So I love the saying, I wish I had more social media in my life, said nobody ever. So it seems like every day we're coming out with a new channel we have to jump on, something new is coming out, something new to add to our, our daily list of to-dos. And we have to look at the dangers of multitasking. And we live in a world where we're 24-7, we're always on, and it seems like we're doing, ten, you know, we have to do two thing, 10 things at once. When really um, multitasking, the statistics show, it makes us much less efficient, lowers our IQ level, worse than losing a night's sleep, and worse than smoking marijuana and working at the same time. <clears throat> so what's happening is our social media pro professional life, it's very full. It's on overdrive always, it's 24 seven, it's mobile, it's never ending. And some of the things that we have to just be mindful, for, mindful to do to create this environment is creating flexible work times in an environment that we can um, nurture creativity. And being creative is, is it's almost, it's almost a, a must all the time. And how can you be creative all the time if you're just going, going, going on a hamster hamster trail? Yep. And you, everyone who creates has environments that creation works for them in, you know? So you have to think about that. Um, creative people tend to need to be inspired by something. And so you have to give them time. You can't just say, here, I need this in 20 minutes because that's just not how creativity works. Um, Again, work environment is critical. I always write in a small, quiet room. Not, I can't write in a room with TV on. That's just how I, I work. Um, and then, let's see. Uh, again, social media is not just nine to five. So that doesn't mean that you're, if your social media, if you want them in your office nine to five, you can't expect them to be checking social media when they get home. You know, you might want to say, okay, you work 10 to three and you keep an eye on these hours at night. And then the next thing, um, support time for learning. I said that earlier. It changes all the time. People or employees need to research and read weekly. So you got to give them time to do that. Um, you need to also provide them time and money to explore new tools and new options. Since don't make their life difficult. Um, flexible hours and breaks when they need it, especially in a crisis. If they say, I need to walk away for a while, you give them 10 minutes. The crisis will still be there when they get back. So with all that, timing is everything. So planning out your social media day and week and month and having tools such as editorial calendars is super important. And also delegating. And this, um, you might be thinking, oh, but I'm a one-person show, I'm a one-person team, or I only have two people, who do I dedicate, delegate to? Um, there, it is possible to delegate even outsourcing, um, maybe outsourcing some writing or delegating to even delegating up and having your boss help you with things, but don't take everything on yourself and then replicating. So looking at this is so important because I see so many of my clients just doing um, reinventing the wheel every week, every day, instead of going back and saying, oh, wow, these things worked amazing and being able to repurpose them and reuse them and then meditate. So 
being mindful, setting aside time, giving the brain a rest, um, tuning up the brain in, in five minutes a day is super beneficial. It's not just this spiritual thing, it's actually scientifically proven. And who meditates? Um, Frederick, you can actually vouch for this. Did they have meditation rooms when you were there? Well, yeah, they had quiet rooms and they had meditation classes and they have sleeping pods and lots of stuff <laughs> to make people be comfortable. Yeah, so I mean, these are, this is, you know, basically the social media professionals have their jobs because of Google, Facebook, and Twitter. <laughs> um, we didn't have them, we wouldn't be here today. So if the, the giants, if, if, if it's coming from the top, if they're doing it, you must know that, um, you know, good is coming out of it because of the success of, of, of those brands. So I use them as an example of, you know, if they're doing it and they have the med meditation rooms for their employees, um, this is setting the bar and setting the example of what, what brands should do small and large. Um, meditation can actually rewire how the brain responds to stress and stress is a huge part of being in the social media world. Like it's not all fun and games. Like a lot of people think it's actually more stressful than not and it's what you make of it. So just some rituals, writing and creating in the morning studies show that that's the best time to be creative. Emails after hours never work and so having expectations for your social media management team um, and also giving them expectations, vice versa, um, try to avoid this. Agendas, meetings never go well without, a meet, without an agenda, so always come prepared with agendas. Phone calls, um, give me a call anytime, never works. This applies to more than just social media managers and professionals, this applies across the board in business making sure that you're just not leaving things open and actually scheduling times. Meeting times, um, picking the best time for meetings is super critical too. So if you pick a time for a meeting that's during your best creative time as a social media person, that's really gonna hinder your productivity. So studies show also 2 p.m. is the best time for meetings and conference calls because your creativity is done in the morning and you're kind of at a lull after lunch. 4 o'clock p.m., just um, FYI, is the worst one of the worst times, um, and also avoiding early morning meetings as well. So we recommend having productivity calendars, or you could call them ca um, editorial calendars for yourself. So leaving time for lunch, giving your, your staff time for lunch and encouraging lunch, encouraging mental breaks, encouraging specified writing time, um, and then looking at your night, your night rituals and, and how those are going. Melissa is gonna talk about company protocols and procedures. Okay, yep, if uh, you have a social media team or even if you're just a small business and right now you have one person, you wanna start creating procedures that will save you time, um, money. What I uh, mentioned, you can keep clicking these by the way, I think there's three, <laughs> um, excuses. If you have pr uh, procedures in place and everyone can look at a book and go, oh, this is what I do in this situation, then you don't have to deal with excuses on why something got messed up. Um, uh, this is something that Lisa has on here. If, if all the different roles are broken down, then everybody knows what to do. Right? Yeah, super important. So even if it's just one or two, two, or if they're just one person on the team, at least they know where to go up and where to go down. And here's an example of a template from a social media policy. This is very short and sweet, but it's at least a guide or a template that you could use on, um, you know, at least starting yours if you don't have one. They need to know what they can or can't do, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Right, and then also related to this is your employee social accounts. What policies do you have? Do you want them to behave different on their account? Are they even supposed to acknowledge that they work for you on their account? That's important as well. Do you want them responding to customers on your account? So have some, some policies for your employees as well. I mean, I think we've seen a record year of lost jobs because of social media issues. Yep. Like, there, it's really becoming zero tolerance for mistakes on, in social media. But if you don't have a guideline for them, then you know you're you're setting both yourself as the brand up for failure and also that your team under you. Yep, and liability as well. Yep. Um, and then the next one, I think, is just a oh yeah, um, some creating protocols. I say plan for the worst. You should have some plans in place for every single situ one of these situations that I have listed. Um, one of the best things that I loved at Moz is we had a manual. I knew who to call and who to wake up in Seattle in every possible situation. I knew what to do and how to do it. So the the stress of me being the single person running social media alone on the East Coast was minimized. 
So if you, as you're working through month after month, just create these uh, with your team. And um, yeah, here's just some examples. There you go. At Google, we had this, uh, so it wasn't social media, but when we were reviewing ads, it was a saying, when in doubt, route. Uh -huh. just, when you weren't sure, route it to your manager. And, uh, and so that makes sense that you have a process for who to route it to in all these situations. And it worked pretty well. Yeah, definitely. And we also like to you know, see having a couple, you know, at least two or three, if not more, critical response plans. So scenarios that you could predict, for example, if you're Chipotle or, you know, a restaurant, what if somebody gets food poisoning and complains about it on social media, but also be channel specific. So what if they tweet about it, then what happens? What if they get, what if it's a bad Yelp review, then what happens? What if it's Facebook? Because you can't just have a one one um, one type of response to apply to all channels because each channel is different. Right. So here's some examples if um, you know our audience wants to use them as starting points. Yeah. The other thing, the why we're saying to do this is because people are documenting. I've seen numerous stories on CNN, screenshots, videos, webinars like us. We put all of the fails at PubCon. <laughs> You have to avoid being documented as a fail. And here's some examples if you did not know um, that you can just do quick searches. Can we switch this slide? Oh, okay. This one? Social fails. Uh, yep. Go to Google search, look for social fails. You'll find articles. This is consistent content for many, many websites that need it. Um, and if you need to show some to your business, let's go to the next slide and I'll show you. It is, you can just go to Google image search and just look for corporate social fails. You will be shocked. Oh my gosh, there's a bad word there. Flip through that one. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, an example um, that we, just like a, a scenario, if you have billing issues, we automatically move them to messages or DMs, uh, tell people, you know, we can't talk about billing over, you know, in front of our audience, so let's talk privately. Then you have like, okay, send it to Lisa, provide them an email or an extension for a phone number. Um, you know, if you they have a plan for billing, then they're good to they're good to go. Log complaints and let someone know. Here's an example of how to deal with angry people. Get them offline. Um, tell them you just want to talk to them and deal with them and, and respond to them right away. Sorry, so, no problem. So anyway, there's just a little couple of examples of what you can do. So I think we're actually at the end. Yep, we're at the end there. Awesome. So um, let's see, if folks have any questions, please uh, send them on to the, the questions panel. Um, so one question I saw coming in is about uh, some of your favorite tools to manage um, kind of social media. I think kind of also with that last point, when people tweet that they're unhappy with something, it's usually just a way for them to try to get a hold of the support team. Um, so any tools that you use to connect all of your data sources and inbound customer calls and emails and tweets into one place, any recommendations there? Uh, well, first of all, I love Buffer for scheduling. Um, yeah. I just want to say that. Um, I like Sprout Social when you have a large company that you can, um, you know, document complaints, um, tag things, uh, of course, Slack as well. Um, that allows me to immediately communicate with, like right now with SimRush, I mean, it's six different countries and 400 people. Like it, Slack allows me from my phone to communicate to anyone at any time. So um, those are my three, I think. Another good one from a customer service standpoint that's a, more of a enterprise level would be Sprinkler, where they actually um, integrate um, customer service and all of the different channels into you know, having one dashboard. Um, right now, if you're a small to medium-sized business or agency, um, you kind of have to piece things together still. There's not, I, I can't say there's one perfect platform that does everything that we're saying. You know, there's things like still, you know, looking at Google Alerts to see if anything has been all of a sudden now makes, makes it into a story, your social media fail. Um, mentions is also a good way to track your, your brand name in um, on social and also in search and SEMrush does that you can they have some yeah. social media tools that let you track mentions which is nice and what uh, another question here is so if you don't really have enough work for a full-time social media person what are some other areas that you've put them on 
to kind of fill their time until that specific need grows bigger? Content <laughs> to start. Um, yeah. e email marketing. Writers, yeah. Um, yeah, the, you put them on the creative side because uh, they're they're really your outreach person. So they, if social media isn't very busy, they tend to know where and how you could reach the audience. I would just say to them, you know, give me a proposal on what you think we need to be doing to um, reach our audience a little bit better. And, and then, of course, you know, see if they're capable of doing those things as well. But And I would say also just doing... Um, like Moses said, the content, but really doing a lot of listening with your competition or inspiring brands that might be like-minded brands, but not your exact competition. And there's always room for optimizing and making sure that whatever your social channels are, you know, that your profiles are as optimized as possible. Um, looking at just the different ways that you have online that might might not fall under the bucket of social, but might fall under the bucket of search, just making sure from an from a organic standpoint that you're doing everything that you can to be proactive. And here I am, you know, making sure that you're getting the, the search results that are influenced by social and being proactive so that in the event something negative does come up, you've already protected yourself as much as you can where you're trying to, you know, kind of be reactive and say, oh, no, I have this terrible review on Yelp and it's the only thing coming up or somebody gave me a bad review on Facebook and you know, nothing, since your profiles weren't as optimized as they could be, they might not be, you know, showing up. So I think always starting with that and, and, and looking what can be done. And, and one more point on competitive analysis. So if you're, you're saying, okay, I want to know what my competitors are doing, um, I always say once you've kind of done a, a local let's say you're a smaller business, you're doing local competitive analysis, take the same niche and, and go to like LA or Chicago or New York and see what other people are doing on their social media channels. Sometimes when you go to larger cities, you get inspired. They have a little more money to do things and you can get some ideas from them as well. Great. Well, let's wrap it up here. Uh, this was excellent. Uh, Lisa and Melissa, I learned a lot. I love those examples that uh, you gave at one point. I I don't know if I cringed or I laughed, but I certainly had a reaction. Uh, when I was... uh, so this was awesome. For everyone who attended, we'll be sending the video out in a few days from now. If you think this was useful, please share it with your friends. It'll go live on uh, Optimizer's YouTube channel later today. And uh, yeah, so we, you can ask us to follow up with you through that little form right there. So we're happy to talk more about all of the services that we provide. Um, whether it's the PPC tools we have or the consulting services of Melissa or Lisa. Um, and Lisa, of course, uh, you have a book coming out soon, right? You want to talk about that for a second? Yes, I'm writing my next book. Thanks, Brad. It's called Digital Detox Secrets. And I was inspired to write it from the process of writing social PR secrets. And I realized the power of work-life balance and really how much more you can get done if you really focus on um, doing things, for example, like meditation and yoga and how it really turns up your creative channel. So it's going to be targeted at the digital professional and um, how to create more space in your life for opportunities. Great. Looking forward to seeing that book. So thanks, everyone, for attending today. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you for our next webinar. Thank thanks you. Thanks for having us.